Good morning. Good, morning. Uh, good to see you all today. And man, do I see a lot of 930 worshipers at 11 o'clock service today. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But you're here at spring break and it is uh, spring forward. So thank you all for being in worship today. During the season of Lent, these 40 days that lead up to our Holy Week and Easter celebrations, we've been inviting lay folks in our church to read scripture. And so today for our 11 o'clock service, Jeff Simmons is going to read from Mark chapter 12 today. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Hear these words. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had all she had to live on. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let's pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for these words. Jeff just read for us from your holy scriptures. Allow them, whether we've heard them a million times or this is our first, to illumine something new to us this day. Allow these tough words and examples to impact and stir with us, within us, your love and your grace, to strive to be more like you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever seen one of those high-powered magnets that just have the ability to like bring objects from a far distance close up before? Yeah, we've had, we had one of those in um, our science class in middle school. You would get these like little small magnetic pieces and there would be this big box and at the end of the big box would be this big magnet and you would put them into the box and zoom, they would fly right over to the magnet in the middle of the box. Have any of you done that, remember that? Yeah, I was... I had that image in my mind. I wondered uh, when, if someone at Randall's were to look at the security footage the other day when I went in, if that's what I look like when I ran to the Easter candy section of Randall's the other day. I mean, zoom, I was there. I came in for Kleenex and eggs. And before I knew it, I was ogling over the Eat Reese's eggs that were there. Oh, man. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, I am a sucker for a holiday candy. I just love it. Uh, From Cadbury eggs to those kitschy little hollow chocolate-covered Easter bunnies, they all have their place in in the candy aisle once a year. Even Peeps fans, who apparently need Jesus more than all of us because... They're fans of peeps. They too have a home this time, just disgusting. They, have, they too have a home this type of year. But sorry, ooh, wow. No one leave, lock the doors. Uh, between that and the uh, Girl Scout cookie pushers, I mean precious children of God, this is a good time for us to be mindful of our sweet balance in this season of spring. Uh, Seeing all this candy this week at Randall's when I ran in made me think about uh, Halloween candy uh, in my neighborhood. I've shared with y'all about the the joys, the sorrows, the brokenness of home ownership. Some of you know about that. It's ups and downs here and being a homeowner almost now for two years. One of the joys for me is getting to pass out Halloween candy in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood goes all out. It's fantastic. And I take special interest in choosing the right kind of candy that I want to give out. There are these bags labeled demon treats that hold this collection of 130 snack size candies of goodness. Candies like Reese's peanut butter cups and almond joys and Kit Kats and Whoppers and milk duds, but who really needs the milk duds? But they're there. They're fine. They're delicious. 
They also at this at the Target I was shopping at uh, have um, the snack size peanut butter M and M's. Um, so I bought a separate bag of those. They're more expensive, but they're my absolute favorite peanut butter M and M's. You can write that down. Oh, praise God! Okay, good. We, we're here. I promise you, there's a point to all this candy talk, friends. But um, but why I get those extra spin more is because I wanted to dominate trick or treating. My house is not a Tootsie Roll kind of zone. You can get your lollipops and dun and dum dum south of Briar Forest because in North Walnut Bend, real men serve real candy. <laughs> if you live in South Walnut Bend, I forgive I um, forgive you and I forgive me, please. I'm sorry for that. But I'm telling you this because here comes Halloween this past year. I was ready to go. I've got this incredible stash of sweets. I grab my lawn chair. I put it out in the front lawn. I'm in my Astros gear because of course I am because the Astros are are playing and they're they're doing well so I can wear my jersey because it's a sense of pride but it's also a Halloween costume. I look across the street and there's the only other dinks on the street, dual income, no kids, probably in the whole neighborhood. And, And they have a golden retriever and and the whole family dressed up as Air Bud with matching jerseys and a basketball. That was their costume. Look, they may have beat the Astro fan across the street, but they could never compete with my com- ca- uh, candy compendium. If this was a battle, I was going to win the war. For the record, there was no battle or war, but inside my mind, I thought this. Okay, back to me. I knew my candy was so good, it was going to beat everyone's, and that there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the candy in the toss pile. You know about the toss pile, parents. It's the candy that you throw away because you don't need it, or maybe you're one of those parents who pour out your kid's bounty and tells them all the stuff they're not going to like, just so you can make your own pile. Can I get a witness in the room? Uh, You know exactly who you are. It's like the old adage goes, fun size is only fun if you eat more than one. I promise you there's a point to this. As the evening wrapped up, uh, I went inside to take a quick hydration break. And while I wasn't looking, Leslie noticed something in my basket. She said, well, 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 look at this. I said, I know, aren't you impressed? This is pretty good candy in here. She goes, sure is. But it looks like someone is keeping their favorite candy to themselves. I didn't know what she was talking about until I looked over into the bucket and saw the proof in the bowl. I was giving away the candy that wasn't the miniature peanut butter M&M's. I had bought them to give away. I had bought them to make my stash even nicer Only slowly, I was starting to give away the other stuff. I was so concerned with the other elements of Halloween, of beating the Airbud family across the street, that I wasn't intentional about my candy distribution, and both consciously and unconsciously selected candy that was lesser value to me. Now, I tell you this neighborhood parable to hopefully paint a picture of a deeper and bigger story that we see in our gospel reading that Jeff read for us today. We all have our own ways of keeping a little something back for ourselves. We don't want to give it all away. We can't be like this noble widow giving the last bit of cash with nothing left even on her ATM card. She's all in. She is the financial model we should all strive to be, giving it all. That's what I was always told about this story. Preachers had taught me for years. Jesus commends the widow because her gift of all in reflects her absolute trust in the God of the temple in which she stands within. After all, Having two coins, she certainly could have just kept one and given another and been applauded for giving 50%. That alone would make her a top-tier giver at this church, anyone who gave 50% of their offering today, or at any church. Our goal as church members here, and really at all churches, 
is to tithe 10% of our annual earnings, a, a biblical calculation dating to the earliest parts of the Old Testament that can be and normally is intimidating. Let's just name it. It's hard to give, but giving should hurt, they say. We would all dream to give like her, and if we didn't give like her when we got older, I remember the pastor saying, well, shame on us. This is the essence of this story that I've carried with me for years. Maybe you did too. And yet sometimes it's important and it's healthy, hear this friends, to reimagine the same takeaways we've always taken away from different stories in scripture. The widow's might might be time for a check-in. So let's do that today, shall we, friends? Here's two things to take away from me today from this scripture that I've been wrestling with. First is the idea of all in. If you, read, if you heard verse 44 by Jeff, it says this, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she got out of her poverty has put, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Everything she had and all she had to live on describes the seriousness of this widow's donation. It's all of it. There is no side pot hanging out somewhere. There's no secret stash of cash in an envelope for a rainy day. It's all of it. However, the Greek translation of this text in verse 44 is less specific with a particular financial amount she gave and more direct about her whole life and her whole living. So what does that mean? Well, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a particular percentage or portion. What this Greek is pointing out is not a calculated amount used for a stewardship or capital campaign spreadsheet. Instead, what it means is that she gave her whole life to God. But why? Was it out of obligation? Was it out of respect? Was it out of religiosity? Was it out of some sort of demand? Was she just a puppet for Jesus to show people exactly what a pious woman or person looks like? I think the answers or questions to all of that are too limiting. Because I think this woman gave her whole life because her whole life depended on it. She was trapped in systems that belittle women, especially widows, and she knew that her future was dependent on her present. There was no alternative than to fully promise her entire life. This might be a controversial thought that I'm going to kind of bring up. And if it is controversial, it steps on your toes a little bit, email me tomorrow, not today. Just think about it. I think Jesus saw a lot of his life in this widow's life not the other way around. But this is the problem with our exegesis of scripture. I know, we're on spring break. Exegesis is a big word. Let me help you out here real fast. Exegesis kind of means like a critical, careful interpretation. Friends, we can get really lazy in our interpretations of scripture sometimes, and we can characterize things that we don't need to. Because listen, if we reduce this widow's story, this widow's giving, and just compare it to our giving in the church today, we've missed the point. And we've set our sails on a bumpy road. And yet we do this sometimes when we're reading scriptures. We take a scripture and we make a character an unofficial servant of the better than thou club. The people that are way better than us. And so we prop these biblical characters in the scripture up so high that we can't attain what they do. And so we check out. But this story of the widow and her might says enough is enough. Because here's the deal. The characters of scripture 
aren't always examples for us to follow. We don't always have to do this thing where we're like, I want to be more like fill in the blank, right? We sometimes say like, I, I wish I was more like Moses in this situation or Aaron or Paul or Barnabas or, Lily, or Lydia. But what we forget is that God deeply wants us to just be the fullest self that we can be offering our full selves to God, not somebody else's self, just us. What if perhaps the characters we so want to emulate are really Jesus showing us what he's going to do? I mean, we can't miss it right here with the, the widow's offering. This widow's offering is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to offer his entire life for the world. He confirmed it over and over again that by following him would mean our whole life giving and our whole life living for him. That's what Jesus has been saying the whole time. And we finally see it. We were almost there last week. But we finally see it this week in the widow's display of both whole life giving and whole life living. Here's the second part that caught my eye. Did you notice this? At the end of this passage that I read, verse 44, which is the conclusion of chapter 12 of Mark, a chapter we've been in for four weeks together here at The Journey. Can you believe it? These stories are all about countercultural ways of living and giving to God. But in that last verse, after the widow gave all that she had, Jesus never commends or congratulates this woman for her impressive offering in comparison to the wealthy among them. I realized earlier in my sermon, I said Jesus commends her. He doesn't. All Jesus does at the end of this story, once the woman gives what she gives, is just tell everybody what she did and what she's done. He says what he sees. And it's been exactly what he's been saying all along the Gospel of Mark. That this story isn't a story of celebration. It's about expectation. You're expected to give your whole life Giving hurts a lot less if we aren't always seeking validation and recognition because of it. But if we're responding to Jesus' expectation of us, because that's what Christ followers do. You see, stewardship is not ultimately about what we give to the church. That's important. But instead, I think stewardship reflects a conviction to us that everything we have has been entrusted by God to us, given with a hope and a purpose to use for the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Stewardship is concerned about helping us use what we have wisely and giving it all back to God who first gave it to us. Did you know stewardship comes from the Greek word oikos or oikon, which means house or household? How do you care for your house? With money? Absolutely. A house needs, I know, a house needs money to take care of it. But is all you do with your house pay for it? I hope not. I hope you explore your home. I hope you learn to understand it more, to tend to it, to invite more people into it, to offer it as a, a place to shelter people from life's storms. And then in return, when you get that down, or you're working on it at least, you start teaching your neighbors about how to tend to their homes. I wonder, friends, what if all of the economic decisions we made were viewed through the lens of Jesus? Think about that for one second. If your faith made the decisions that you did for what you were buying, using, and putting your worth in, what would it teach us about ourselves? My hope is that in doing so, in trying to do so, which I want to challenge all of you to do, is that we would learn 
that God knows nothing else than to give all of God's self to the world. God does this in Jesus. God is doing this through the widow. And may God keep doing it, believe it or not, through you and through me if we open our eyes to it. Maybe today it's not a why question for you, but it's a what question. What might God do in you because you see through the lens of Christ and now live and give with a totally different perspective because you value even more what God has entrusted you that you didn't even know you had the entire time? I was a little defeated coming back in after passing out candy all of Leslie's call out of me, I was committed to giving every bit of those children those peanut butter snack size M&Ms. They'd be like, no, sir, no more candy. Yes, take another. Take another piece of candy. By the end of the night, (laughs) I didn't have any more candy in my bowl. A great success for my goal to buy everyone candy, even though I didn't have any snack size peanut butter M&Ms left. I went inside and Leslie's like, vibe check? How are we doing over here? I showed her the empty bucket. But before I could look back at her and say, "Uh, but I don't have any, she opened the pantry and pulled out a king-size bag of peanut butter M&Ms. A big, surprising smile came across my face when she did that. She looked at me and said, Michael, these have been here all along. You know, I was just so caught up in giving and getting the snack size. I couldn't see the king's size right in my midst. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray together. Good and loving God, we can get so caught up in the little stuff. And little wins feel real nice in the moment. Maybe right now we're in a season of life where we could just, we just crave a little win, and that's good. But if we look through the lens of you, your son, and we can uh, imagine and at, shift the question from why but to what, what might you do through me, it changes everything. It opens up the possibilities of something that you entrust to us, which is yourself. Might we strive to be vessels of your grace and love in the world? Might we be good stewards of what you hope we do with what all you've been given? It's all a gift. It's all a gift. Help us, oh God. In Jesus' name. Amen.